So, a really common question I see in a lot of Facebook groups, on YouTube, and YouTube videos, and all over the internet is, how much land does it take to grow all of your food for your family? It, how much food can you produce on a small area? And, <laughs> kitten, that's a very loud cat. There are some people out there who will answer the question automatically, 10 acres or get as much land as you possibly can. Permaculture founder Bill Molson would often say that you should do it on the minimum amount that you possibly can and your life will be a whole lot easier for it. Uh, he looked at people who were having like uh, lots of acreage to be able to do this sort of thing and called them land poor. Not because they didn't have enough land, but because they had so much land that it was taking up all their time and their wealth and energy just to maintain the land. All the extra land really wasn't meeting their goals at all. So, how much does it really take? Hi, I'm just some guy with a garden, but today I'm gonna tell you how I grow a complete diet for my family on just a few hours of work per week, and how I do that on less than an acre, without plastics, without poison, and without petroleum, or at least not much of them. And I do that while regenerating soil, increasing biodiversity, stewarding endangered native species, sequestering carbon in the soil, fighting climate change, and saving water. But before we get too far into all this, first here's a little spoiler. How did I do that? Well, I did it by transforming this eroded, compacted urban site with basically no soil left because it's on a slope in, an, in a city and people were parking on it and destroying it. I transformed that into this beautiful, abundant paradise filled with over 200 species of edible and medicinal plants. Uh, first, a few caveats. Now, when I say I grew a complete diet for my family, what I usually say is I grew a complete hypothetical diet for my family. And some people say, well, <laughs> why didn't you do it for real? You could, anybody can grow a hypothetical diet. Uh, that's not exactly what I mean. I don't mean that I know how. I mean, I actually did grow enough food. But you know what? I'm a very practical kind of person. I'm not super hardcore like some of the people on social media. I'm not going to hire a camera guy and hire a whole production company to take care of me so I can spend 50 hours a week or I can claim that I grew every single calorie that I ate for a year or something. Because what's the point in that? Can you hire a company to take care of you? Then whatever I found probably wouldn't be applicable to you. You know, I'd do things completely differently if it didn't have to be practical. I had to do it in a way that fit into the life and work schedule of a real person, and that makes uh, what I figured out, hopefully, applicable to people like you. Instead, you know, we still exchanged uh, some of the money that we made because I also grew tens of thousands of dollars of additional produce and plants which I sold. So I would use some of that money to buy things, uh, things that I couldn't grow. To be honest, I eat a lot of, I, I eat a lot of rice and we ate out a lot. Uh, too. It just add some diversity to the diet and spice to life. Huh? We did use the tools that I'm going to talk about to uh, actually plan out and make sure that we were going far more calories than the family and the household actually needed and uh, a complete nutritional diet so that it wasn't just the empty calories but that all of our nutritional needs were well met through a full year and that was right there in the landscape waiting for us. And we did all that on a minimum amount of time. Now, what does it mean when I say a few hours of work per week? I mean, I tracked all of our inputs and outputs and uh, how much time everything took. And on average, as an average, I usually spent about two hours or less per week over the course of the growing season to do all of the, uh, like, uh, uh, non-harvest work and maintenance. You know, with harvest and food prep, it was a bit more than that. But I like to keep those things to a minimum too. I'm going to talk about some of the tools and tricks that I use to make that happen as well. But in the end, 
uh, I uh, allow people around me who observe the lifestyle, who ate with us and hung out with us, uh, and who watched our social media. Uh, you can get on there and you could see I would post uh, my daily meals over the course of the year for many years, um, almost, uh, almost meal per meal, you know, uh, in some cases in some of my social media. And a lot of people were saying I seem to grow a lot more of my own food than most people in the movement, and that, that was true. So in addition to it being a hypothetical complete diet, it was a very practical way to grow a lot of food for, uh, for the people in the household. As I like to say, we don't need to be hardcore about all of this stuff. What we need to do is be hardcore about being real practical if we want this kind of thing to catch on and really have a big impact. Which brings us to why? Why did I do this anyway? You know, why, why was I trying to grow a lot of my own food? So I came to uh, the Back to the Land movement from uh, being an environmentalist and an activist. And uh, part of that is just because of the way I grew up. I grew up in a farming situation, uh, which means that I ate pizza. Like most farmers around my area who were growing farm crops and they were full-time farmers when it came to dinner time they were too beaten broken down and you know gardens were considered largely impractical in a lot of ways even though we always had one and did a market garden too we didn't eat the produce from it we ate pizza hut and uh, you know sold that stuff to, to presumably pay for pizza hut uh, I think that's surprising to a lot of people uh, who may hear this, uh, but talking to a lot of other farmers and people who really grew up in the farming background, that seemed to be more the case. The, the farming communities historically in the United States haven't really been about self-sufficiency or sustainability of any kind. So I saw that side of it, and I saw that it was a system that really was not working well for farmers or for the planet. In fact, as I came to learn, the food system is the number one cause of climate change. It's the number one driver of mass extinctions. It's our number one cause of deforestation. It's the number one cause of ocean dead zones, of oil, of soil loss. It, it requires a lot of fossil fuels and it harms biodiversity. It's a system that basically doesn't work well for anyone. In permaculture terms, we'd say it's a system designed to fail. So my main motivation was to get a better understanding of how we could really build a just and sustainable food system. And if I could figure out how to do that for myself as a, sort of the microcosm in my backyard, that meant that I would have the tools necessary to build a just and sustainable diet locally. The things that I could learn in my own yard would be useful to other people beyond that. Now, it really wasn't about self-sufficiency. It was about building community sufficiency. And really, that's why I'd like to advocate for yeah, no man is an island. Uh, by just trying to grow all of our own food, it's really just a silly exercise in some ways. A much more practical exercise is to grow a high value garden that provides a lot of value and benefits to you and your family. That makes a lot more sense. But as an experiment for learning a lot, it, it was very profound for me. And then of course also, it felt good in some ways to have that food security right there in my own yard, to know that if shit hit the fan, that my family would be taken care of, my household and the people around me would be taken care of. So I have to admit that still felt, felt good in some ways. Be able to really save money, grow real wealth. You know, uh, people who do the lifestyle and they're spending 60, 70 hours a week self-exploiting, making $3 an hour and using a lot of plastics and fossil fuels in order to do that, it's not really anything that's going to solve real world problems. I wanted to do it in a way that would be applicable to other people. It, real people have to have jobs in this economy to support their families. They have, they have to raise their families. It's, it's, you know, the kind of systems that we're emulating really have never worked well for anyone. I uh, went and did some ethnographies uh, of Amish communities, a couple of them, and got to spend some time in a couple different occasions with our Amish farm families. And what I saw was that, uh, you know, 
we've really romanticized the Amish, but they weren't really doing much that's much more sustainable than anybody else. They were often working 50, 60 hours a week. And, uh, you know, they were using lots of fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, spraying the bejesus out of that stuff, giving animals antibiotics. <laughs> it was basically very conventional forms of farming. They were tilling the heck out of it, losing soil. It wasn't sustainable at all. When it came to overall self-sufficiency, they were still buying a lot of food at the grocery store. They were buying a lot of their clothing uh, items. They might be making the clothing in-house, but they were actually buying the fabrics and they were fabrics made of fossil fuels, a lot of times synthetics, and they were made in sweatshops overseas because they were buying these things really cheaply. So what I saw was that I became part of the sustainable food movement to try to build a sustainable food movement. But what we were doing instead, I came to realize, was actually building something that wasn't very sustainable. It wasn't sustainable to people because it relied on exploiting us and themselves. And it was you know, generally using a lot of plastics in a lot of cases and was using a lot of fossil fuels and often more tilling than industrial agriculture. And yet, uh, from my research, I, tend, I, I found out that traditional societies were meeting most of their own needs, usually on like just a few hours of work per week. It's really consistent over a long period of time all around the world and often on less than a third of an acre. Why can't we do that? It was around about that time I discovered permaculture and permaculture and a few other key techniques really are what allowed me to transform my diet and solve this problem over the course of a couple of decades of working on it. Permaculture, the main premise of it is that we just simply put in time to design things that will meet our needs. So if my goal was to grow a lot of my own food on the minimum amount of time possible, uh, without importing any fertilizers, without using plastics and petroleum and fossil and poisons and all that, uh, then I needed to design a system that would meet those goals. Oh, I'm going to tell you about some of the key design components that allowed me to, to really uh, figure that out. One of the big ideas there is that if we have this work like fertilizing and watering and weeding and dealing with pests, that we design solutions to those right into the system. So instead of importing fertility, we design the gardens to create their own fertility by using nitrogen fixers, deep mulch that's grown in place. You know, keep in mind that a conventional organic perspective is that you need about an inch of compost per season to keep the garden fed. And a lot of research uh, and just plain looking at the nutrients in uh, mulch materials, most organic mulches, four inches or so of them uh, per season will provide that same nutrients as one inch of compost. High biodiversity. High biodiversity has been found in a lot of cases to create a lot of fertility. So we're looking at design systems that will maintain ever growing, regenerating soil fertility instead of having to import it. Now, this was a big deal for me because a lot of people can say, well, I grow all my own food on an acre and yet they're using three acres of feed to feed their cow that's on, you know, like a quarter of an acre of their yard, but it takes three acres of feed to feed that cow. So really they're using four acres and I think that's cheating. So one of the big design parameters was to make sure that the garden was growing all of its own fertility too. Oh, one of the biggest keys of permaculture is called permaculture zones. This is the number two big tool that helped me design the system is permaculture zones. Another way of putting this is uh, we could call it the intensivity spectrum between intensive crops where you put in a lot of work to them and a lot more time, but they give you a really big yield and extensive which are mostly managed by nature. We don't have to do a whole lot with them and they still produce a yield for us on almost no work. 
So if you really want to minimize the work that you're spending in the garden, you got to fit this zone system is really powerful for helping you balance and get the maximum yield out of the minimum time. Beyond that, zones are amazing because they're permaculture's number one tool for uh, fertility. They're the number one tool for managing weeds. They're the number one tool for reducing your time in irrigation. They're your number one tool for reducing your pest prevention work. Which brings us to tool three, which is about that intensive spectrum, getting the maximum amount of productivity out of a small space and a small amount of work. And one of the, in permaculture, what we do is we look for tools to meet our needs. And one of the best tools we can find, one of the best patterns we can find to accomplish that job is grow biointensive. I really recommend the book, How to Grow More Vegetables Than You Ever Thought Possible in Less Space Than You Ever Could Have Imagined. Or it's something like that. It's a very long title by John Jevons. It's an amazing book and it shows you the right spacings and design elements to really maximize your yields. Uh, there's great peer-reviewed research that shows that uh, these systems often get 10, 20, even up to 40 times the yields of conventional agriculture systems. That we can really maximize the productivity in a very small space. When you do that, it saves a ton of time. Uh, along with that, is the uh, the uh, pamphlet One Circle, and that shows how to design a garden that uh, has complete human diet in the minimum space possible. So that a lot gave me a lot of the tools that I needed to do this research to make sure that I was providing a complete diet in the garden um, for all the people who lived in the house. So that was really indispensable. But before we got into micromanaging the nutrients, the big issue is calories, getting enough calories to feed everybody in the house. Grow Biointensive has this system of, uh, of, of calorie crops and carb crops, uh, often called carbon crops. And the main thing about this is it shows us how to grow a ton of calories and how to do it in a way where we're growing a lot of compost materials or mulch materials so that we can maintain the fertility of the system. Grow biointensive gardens can grow all of their own fertility and not require those inputs. So combined with permaculture tools, it can be really powerful. So let's look at those calorie crops because that is the biggest limiting factor, right? How do you actually grow enough calories for people in the household without having 10 acres of property? I ended up relying on a few main crops and uh, one of the, some of the reasons why are they needed to be really easy. They need to be easy to store and process and turn into meals. I didn't want to be spending a ton of my lifetime uh, pickling everything and turning everything into, and besides it's difficult to do that sort of preservation with calorie crops. If you're doing something like wheat, wheat takes a lot of space and unfortunately and it uh, tends to be take a lot of work in order to process it. Um, I organized a grains cooperative several years ago, and we did all the process from start to finish for just about all of the main calorie crops, and a lot of them were a lot of work. But there were a few that are A-plus bonus for homesteaders that are just easy, easy, easy. And the absolute easiest crop there is has to be maize. It's amazing. So even at low conventional yields, uh, keep in mind we should be able to absolutely trounce that in a grow biointensive system or a permaculture system. Uh, but even low, low uh, uh, industrial yields, you can feed 30 people a year uh, all the calories they need on a single acre. So think about that. When we're, when we're trying to plan out the garden, if you're using maize there, then basically, you know, two to 4,000 square feet uh, uh, dedicated to a maize system, a corn system, 
should provide a backstop to make sure you have all of the calories that you need for the family. And so that was one of the mainstays of my system, was about that size, dedicated to a Three Sisters garden. Now, you can look on uh, transformativeadventures.org where I documented the yields from that system. And uh, I did it as Three Sisters, really about 30 sisters, because it was in an edible meadow system using slash mulch, so it was completely no-till. Uh, and required no imported fertility whatsoever and didn't require any watering. And I hit that same calorie rate that would uh, feed about 30 people per acres. So that, you know, right there I can say, done. We've, we've provided all of the calories for the family, but that, that's cheating, right? I mean, uh, who can eat corn for every meal for a full year? Second really great crop is amaranth. Amaranth works about the same way, um, where you can harvest the plants whole, hang them, and only thresh what you need at a time. If you're going to try to thresh it all as an industrial kind of thing, it's a lot of work, believe me. But if you're doing it in a traditional homesteading kind of way, the way it was always done was just to, to keep it, excuse me, thresh a little bit to use and then move on. And so it's an amazing crop for that. It's extremely versatile. Both of these two crops, maize and corn, you can make them like polenta, you can make grains out of them, you can make breads out of them and flatbreads, you can make tortillas, you can make soups, you can do so much with corn and amaranth. So they're two really super products to use. Next up, there's one crop, or a few crops really, that really even beat corn. One is potatoes. So I always did uh, a lot of potatoes in my, in my guilds. Um, so, and, and uh, potatoes throughout the system kind of growing wild in some cases too. So potatoes were a major food crop. And one of the best things about potatoes is they produce really easy and they require very little in the way of processing. You can go outside, grab a bunch of spring potatoes, wash them, uh, roast them just like they are, grizzle them with olive oil, salt, uh, maybe a little lemon at the end, throw some oregano pesto on there. It's amazing and requires very little in the way of work. Potatoes are so versatile too. So now we're getting up to something that really looks like a much more interesting diet. To that, a whole lot of root veggies. Um, so a lot of the root vegetables can provide a real diversity of calories to the diet uh, throughout the, and be available through the whole year. They keep really well. Um, so I always did a lot of root crops in the garden as well. And then it, looking at how this overall garden worked, it was done on a six bed rotation system uh, as, as, as the main part of it. There was a second section that was a field system for slash mulch for three sisters where I grew corn and amaranth. And these were the main productive beds. Then, of course, they also prioritized a lot of daily greens for salads every day because nothing can do more for your nutrition and your health than eating diverse salads every day. And making sure that I had all of those plants to provide all the nutrients I needed. Things like sweet potatoes are important to uh, finish up and fill up those, uh, those calorie needs and those nutritional needs we want to meet. And that takes us to the fourth most important thing, which is the extensive type systems, which these are mostly um, at, uh, in my systems, forest garden guilds, as we like to say. A guild is a self-organizing ecosystem that kind of mimics nature to grow itself with as little work as possible. Uh, and also uh, hedgerow type systems. So those two things integrated together provided a lot of the uh, fertility for the garden and they provided a lot of nutrients, uh, uh, really super diverse sets of nutrients from wild plants that are super nutrient dense and a lot of really easy calories. When it comes to the extensive uh, system calorie crops, those include uh, potatoes, which kind of can grow wild in a lot of these systems with just some tricks to make it work. Uh, yams uh, are really important too as a climber that produces a ton of calories and they're very useful. Uh, 
and Claytonia virginica, other wild roots, bulbs, lots of onions and garlics, which are great for our health and nutrition and also really high in calories. Most of those grew or grow in my systems uh, with very little work because they're simply integrated into these very wild kinds of ecosystems. And then of course, in those hedgerows, in those forest gardens, there's one really important calorie crop, and that is the Jerusalem artichoke. Sun chokes or Jerusalem artichokes are North American native plant, and they're, they grow, they practically grow themselves here. They're famous as weeds, and yet, they're the most productive plant we can grow in our region uh, per square foot in terms of calories in most cases. So a thousand square feet of sunchokes, just a thousand square feet that's well tended and productive can easily produce the calories for a family of four for the year. So again, I always made sure to have that thousand square feet of sunchokes integrated into the edges of hedgerows and forest gardens to provide another backstop. I knew even if my corn crop failed, I would still have these sunchokes to provide 100% of the calories for the family. Then there was one thing that was really kind of cheating, which would, there, there was an old, highly productive, large, old, uh, massive oak tree on the property and a single oak can provide all of the calories in a mast year for a family of four as well. Oak acorns make great flour, they make great soups, one of my absolute favorite soups, so right? At number two after Jerusalem artichoke soup. And so when it comes to protein, a lot of the protein needs were met by a lot of the daily greens in the garden. Leafy greens can be really high in protein. Um, I grew lots of beans and peas and leguminous crops to get extra protein going in the diet. Um, you know, to be honest, I feel like I, in my future goals are to get better at plant-based sources of protein, simply because uh, once you add uh, livestock of any kind into a, a system, it dramatically increases the amount of area it takes in order to grow all your own food. You go from, you know, like I said earlier, as soon as you go include a cow, you go from requiring one third of an acre to grow all of your own food for your family. And all of a sudden you need like four, three or four acres minimum to grow all the food for your family. And it requires you know, 10, 20 hours a week per, uh, more than it would without them. So just being practical, it's really good to know how to grow all your own food uh, from these plant-based sources if you wanna do it on the least amount of time and land areas possible. But, uh, you know, some of the tree crops filled in for protein too. There were black walnuts always around everywhere in any northern American city. And uh, there's also uh, hazelnuts. So the hazelnut bushes became very productive by year three and uh, they're great. Uh, I really love hickory nuts. You can smash a lot of these, just soak them in water and make nut milks at home. It's, you know, better than paying silk to do that for you. And really the, the biggest challenge of all though, I have to admit, are fats. Looking at the dietary require, requirements, I can say in a hypothetical way, bam, we crossed off fats from the diet. But in terms of having, <laughs> that's a kitten, uh, in, in terms of having a complete diet uh, and being able to actually cook the food, having cooking fats was a real challenge. So. Um, my main way of trying to solve that were sunflowers and squash, squash seeds and pumpkin seeds. I like the potato press to press those. Uh, to be honest though, it really adds to the amount of processing time uh, required. So usually that was something that was more like just to show off <laughs> and be hardcore instead of really practically providing a lot of the cooking fats for the family. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that's a caveat, being totally open and honest about that. It's something I might want to try to, to, to improve on. Yeah, you know, if, if shit hits the fan, the Canada goose is apparently a great source of <laughs> fats. Um, but uh, also, again, it might be something where someone in the community can you know, buy those squash seeds, buy uh, pumpkin seeds, process those in a potato type system and sell those on the market. Um, I, I've considered doing that sort of thing myself. And it definitely could fit in 
to a system where you grow all your own food on about an acre. Well, it's windy, so I just moved inside. Uh, but there's one thing about these extensive systems that I really want to, uh, to tell you about. The number four kind of tool that really made growing a lot of my own food possible. And that is called the Guild Matrix concept. Remember, guilds are little uh, gardens that are designed to work like ecosystems. Jerry the cat says hi in the background. And uh, they're self-organizing and, and take care of themselves. And uh, there's a whole lot we could say about guild theory and learning guild theory, but um, one of the really cutting edge uh, concepts from ecology has to do with guild matrix. And when you look around at wild ecosystems, you see that there's usually some sort of set of plants that kind of tie the whole room together, as, uh, as uh, the little Lebowski might have said. And, uh, and so the, usually these sets of plants kind of work together and they, they make the backdrop for the whole ecosystem. And uh, if we want to be really smart gardeners, then we will design our guilds around our own little guild matrix, matrices like this, because then we have uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the mushy background matrix. You can kind of think of the, the chocolate chip cookie metaphor. Um, you know, do you like the, 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 the chocolate chips or do you like the bland cookie matrix better? And the best chocolate chip cookie has a mix of both the bland cookie matrix and the chocolate chips or chocolate chunks. And uh, so we might have main crop plants, main focus plants that we want in our guilds. Those are the chocolate chips. But it's really important to have very useful chocolate chip cookie dough matrix. And so if we can figure out a mix of a few plants that are really easy, really vigorous and keep weeds out and self-replicate and really dominate the ecosystem uh, so that weeds don't get in there. And most importantly, they're super, super useful in a big abundance. Then that really tends to make the guild really work well. And if you want to have a garden that really produces a ton of calories on a low amount of work, having really productive high calorie plants in your guild matrix is just like a must. So for me, some of those could be crones, which are great in this, in a mint root. It's a mint family plant that produces an edible tuber. So it grows like a mint really wild and vigorously, but then it has this, you know, tuber that you can eat. Um, and uh, garlic and onions, again, are like uh, perennial onions, like walking onions. They produce really abundantly. They're fantastic. And, you know, you can use them at practically every single meal. If you nail all that and you get all that right, you end up having a really easy garden. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Guild Matrix, you can uh, look on transformativeventures.org. There's a couple of articles on Guild Matrix. And uh, one of them is called Hamburger Bushes. Uh, that sounds weird. Look it up and you'll figure out why. All right. So that's our four main tools. Permaculture in general. The zone system in particular, uh, with that intensivity spectrum, when it comes to the intensive, grow biointensive type planning. And when it comes to the extensive gardens, it's all about the guild matrix, baby. That's it. Those are the four tools that really helped me achieve uh, uh, achieve my goals. Summarizing all that into a plan that anyone can use to uh, be more food self-sufficient and grow a lot more of their own food, let's kind of review what we've gone over. So we found that uh, we have a few crops, maize and sunchokes and amaranth that are particularly useful because they can be grown very easily in very extensive systems in hedgerows and guilds and then just uh, slash mulch systems and edible meadows for the, uh, for the, uh, for the maize and for, um, for three sisters. Uh, we found that, uh, you know, in, uh, that overall they can produce enough calories for more than 30 people per acre. So if we break that break that down and we say we want to uh, have uh, um, 
you know, produce enough food for, uh, for a family of four, we can break that down and say, even if we're wasting some space and we have some, we're not really pushing productivity really hard, if we can devote a quarter of an acre to kind of backstop plants that are very wild, very easy, very low maintenance, uh, that include you know, uh, 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 a thousand square feet or a couple thousand square feet in, uh, in Jerusalem artichokes integrated into forest gardens and hedgerows. And uh, that uh, couple thousand square feet of maize. And so basically we're talking about a quarter acre, devoting a quarter of an acre to true food security based on those crops. With those, you're going to get some sunflowers in there, hopefully, in the Three Sisters Guild. You're going to get squash, so you're going to have some seeds for pressable fats. Uh, you're going to get beans in there, so there's going to be some extra protein. So quarter acre for calories. That's also going to grow a lot of fertility and a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, mulch materials as well. So that system is going to do more than just grow calories. It's going to help us grow fertility for the garden as well. Then after that, we can take and break down maybe just a thousand square feet of real intensive garden. We can throw some more potatoes in there too to have some more diversity. Uh, and this is where we're going to really focus in on getting all of our nutrients met. That one circle pamphlet is really useful for doing that. I could do another whole uh, video on the math and the, the breakdown and the particular plans that I did, but it's, it, it, we're getting really in depth already here. Uh, then beyond that, having some really extensive forest gardens to grow lots of wild greens that are super nutrient dense, tons of fruit just to have, who doesn't want fruit? And uh, also to produce fertility for the rest of the garden. Forest areas can produce more nutrients than they need and help to grow the rest of the garden. Trying to include some oaks in there and some chestnuts for more calories just for security and maybe some hazelnuts and other nuts for, um, for protein. And overall, on far less than an acre, we can produce a, a really uh, a healthy, uh, diverse diet there. Maybe do another thousand square feet someplace and really simple procreate uh, 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 propagation garden techniques um, so that we can generate a lot of income. I think you can do 10 grand easy off a thousand square feet of really smart, well-designed uh, garden there. We're keeping everything real tight, really small. So it's going to be really easy, really practical. And that's a great model for a garden right there. So what did I learn from, from this experience of growing uh, uh, this hypothetical complete diet over the course of six, seven years that I was doing it? One, it made me feel a lot more empowered. And it helped me to really understand that we can really build a just and sustainable local diet in our region um, based on these same sorts of crops and same sorts of technologies. We can build food sovereignty independent of this destructive, suicidal, global corporate system. And we can uh, balance out having farmers do some of the work and having more of us having more hands on food, because I think that's what we're going to require, be required to do if we want to build a truly just and sustainable food system. More people are simply going to have to grow more of their own food. And, and I learned that we can do it without plastics, poisons, and petroleum. We don't need those inputs in order to have a truly uh, functional, fully uh, vibrant, diverse, healthy local cuisine that's based on the seasons. And that's one of the biggest things that I learned about it is that if you do it right, it doesn't have to feel like a burden. It can be really enriching for your life. You can do it. And once you dial in, it, it takes time to get it right. You know, it takes per, in permaculture, we say it's protracted knowledge and observation over protracted labor. So it takes time to figure out, learn those systems and get them right. Once they're set up, 
we can do this on in a way that really enhances our lives, that doesn't take a lot of time and that doesn't feel like a lot of burden and connects us with nature, connects us with our own food, connects us with the seasonal cuisine. And uh, it's truly a beautiful way of living. Beyond that, this kind of garden provided my uh, li ended up providing my livelihood on the site um, in a way that felt sustainable to me. I had people coming over to visit this beautiful, abundant paradise all the time. If you have a really great garden, you're going to have tons of friends and community. I, people were coming over on an almost daily basis to pick up produce, to pick up plants, to buy worms from me, uh, all of this other stuff, and uh, to learn in classes with me. And uh, it was a really rewarding and enriching way to live as well. So I hope that you found something in this video that's going to help you meet some more of your own goals. Um, and keep in mind a lot of the images from this have been from the book Beauty and Abundance, which is all about transforming your landscape to create a beautiful, abundant home paradise that can meet your needs in exactly the sort of way. And check out the transformativeadventures.org site. Lots of great articles on there. And if you're on Facebook, check out the Transformative Adventures Facebook group. It has some of the smartest, uh, really wonderful people that I have uh, had the chance to meet online and the permaculture world anywhere. So check that out. Thanks for watching. And please share this video if you found it useful. All right. Thanks.